Welcome to Behavioral Health Champions, a series of interviews in which we talk with members of the legislature and other stakeholders about how California can really become a national model, if you will, when it comes to creating parity for behavioral health. And uh, we want to talk about how to improve the system here in California and what can be done. I'm Kevin Riggs on behalf of the Behavioral Health Action Coalition. That coalition is really aimed at reducing stigma and also trying to increase priority attention to the issue. And with that, we are joined here today in Laguna Hills by State Senator Pat Bates, who represents the 65th Senate District. Senator Bates, always good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, let's start with a little bit of your background. You have a degree in psychology. True. And you worked for LA County for a while as a social worker. Correct, about uh, 13 years. How did you get into that line of work initially? What was it that led you to that? And then how did that sort of inform your thinking as you traveled to Sacramento and worked at the state level? You know, it's a very interesting time, I think, in, in the history, let's say, of behavioral health. I was a psych major, and uh, unfortunately or fortunately, the jobs available to us with just a BA in psychology at that time was entry-level social work with the Department of Public Social Services. And I think it was just called the County Welfare Department or the State Welfare Department at that time, but it changed the name. So that seemed to be the perfect fit, uh, and I uh, took the training. We were social worker trainees and then moved on to assignment. Uh, shortly after that, I was put on adult AIDS. That's where the need was. And uh, amongst those aid programs, so it was aid to the blind, aid to the disabled, and aid to the aged, uh, old age security. So that was my assignment. And I became very aware at that time of the number of people who had, you know, major uh, issues, and that's why they were, let's say, uh, unproductive. Even not the seniors, that was kind of a category, but the aid to the disabled and the aid to the blind. Uh, resources very limited at that time to really help the individuals, and especially with the aid to the disabled. And the stories that, uh, you know, befell us uh, after Lantern and Petra Short Act came in were pretty significant. Uh, the hospital, uh, you know, forced hospital placement and long-term uh, mental hospital placements were eliminated. Uh, had the process, the 5150s, the 5152s, I think, came into being. But the people that we were seeing uh, at the uh, entry level, I was an intake supervisor at that time, were pretty dramatic and thinking what we really need here are more resources because we can't really handle some of these people with the extreme uh, mental health issues, but not necessarily danger to themselves or others. Remember, that was the category. And I was interviewing people who really were paranoid schizophrenic, who believed that they would not hurt others uh, or themselves. Uh, that would be almost an entry level as I filled out papers for them, uh, because they knew if that was the case, they were in trouble, but that they had major problems, and they certainly needed financial assistance and medical assistance. Interestingly enough, I was one of the first caseworkers and supervisors for the Medi-Cal program. Medi-Cal came in to actually help pay for uh, the uh, health uh, needs of the indigent at that time, but in the aid to the disabled program, it was to pay for the psychiatrist to, to evaluate these people to see if they were actually eligible for financial assistance out in an independent setting. So that was my background and uh, many, many years uh, pretty working tough job. pretty tough and interviewing folks. And, you know, we have a lot of substance abuse now. In those days, there were three different categories of people that came through our, our network. We had those who were addicted to heroin, hero, heroin. Uh, and then a lot of those, uh, you know, we have a lot of talk about marijuana these days, but believe me, when I was a caseworker, a lot of the history, when I take the history, it started with smoking marijuana onto heroin. And then you had LSD, remember that was the generation, and we had kids who'd been convinced that they'd be able to see a greater society, a greater planet. And I had one young man who was the uh, president, uh, student body president in one of the principal high schools in uh, Long Beach where I worked, and he, had, he was gone. Uh, he was so disturbed at that time. He thought he was a lion. He used to sit on the desk when I interviewed him. Hmm. So those were the things we were up against, and what were our resources? Uh, because they were not going to be committed, and so we would give them vouchers for uh, you know, their uh, hotel or apartments. Uh, not many parents wanted to keep them. So it was a time for those early years, and so we're talking about the 
late 60s right through the 70s that I did that work and uh, it certainly formed a lot of thoughts about what was needed out there in terms of resources to help people and to maintain. Methadone came in uh, to uh, attempt on the addiction but for the mental health needs that were not 5150s or permanent uh, commitment uh, just weren't there and you know we struggled. So you are now in public service. You've been doing that for a long time. You are in your second term in the state senate. You were on the board of supervisors in Orange County. You were in the assembly before that. What uh, at what point did you decide to make a move uh, into the uh, interesting world of being an elected official? You know, this is a great story. Um, I moved from my um, home in Long Beach to Orange County and needed to be involved because I left all of, well, I was no longer employed, but I had, uh, you know, many philanthropic uh, so, uh, a, uh, organizations that I was party to, so what am I going to do now? So there was a situation in South Orange County, no sidewalks, no bike lanes, no stop signs, and I was very fearful of my children who used to ride their bike or walk to school, and they were still in elementary school, so what am I going to do? So I grew joined this group of women who had formed a group called Safer, uh, Crown, Safer uh, Traffic for Crown Valley Parkway, which was the big speedway. Long story short, I became the leader of that group, and we started attacking the County Board of Supervisors for their failure to install traffic safety measures in our community. I got to be known as the traffic lady because that's <laughs> all, it was all about my kids. It's all a about basic <laughs> local public safety. <laughs> exactly. Issue. So, uh, what we did is we learned how to compute the traffic uh, at uh, intersections, how intersections were working, and we would go to the Board of Supervisors and use the actual data, mathematical data, to show that they weren't meeting state law. And it really made a difference. Uh, so, it's time to incorporate. Uh, because we want to use the local dollars for those traffic safety improvements. So who leads the uh, incorporation? Me. And when we would go to the board with our pleas, uh, I was not greeted friendly. They said, oh, here come those women with calculators, because we actually use calculators to count traffic. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were kind of demeaned as just those women with calculators. How They called us housewives with calculators. So long story short, we were able to incorporate because people wanted local control. And I became the first mayor because everybody knew me by that time. So when I got to the assembly, uh, because again, I was known and that uh, term limits had come in, and I had an opportunity to run for that, it was successful. And when I arrived at the assembly, uh, this is a true story, the uh, individual uh, young man who sat next to me in geometry in 10th grade saw me come onto the floor and we were both so shy that we hid in the back of the room so the teacher wouldn't call on us. So he looked out there and he said, oh my God, Pat, how did you ever get here? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you never underestimate a housewife with a calculator. <laughs> so I said, we can do great things. So that got me into the legislature and interestingly enough, Kevin, maybe your next question, what do I wind up on as I wind up on the health committee? And Helen Thompson uh, was uh, the chair of that committee. I was, uh, yeah, yeah, I was vice chair, mm -hmm. and Laura's Law. Laura's Law comes along. And uh, very, very controversial at that time, still somewhat uh, in terms of whether a person can be forced to take medication, even though court ordered. Uh, but uh, I believe the people in the behavioral health network and our behavioral health professionals uh, really, uh, if not unanimously, very significantly believe that it has helped a lot with the, uh, um, what is it, um, AOT, uh, outpatient treatment, right. uh, assisted, and it has made a difference. And so back to my days as a social worker with the aid to the disabled, if we'd had something like that, a resource like that, with the right situation driven by, uh, you know, the healthcare professionals that make that uh, evaluation, it could have helped, I think, significantly to help those people that I shared were, had no place to go. They were not 5150s, they were not permanently uh, put in mental uh, health facilities, but they were out there uh, and with no resources to really help them. And I think Many were led to uh, probably addictions of various sources, alcoholism, heroin, or LSD. 
So you had this professional background that really helped you to develop interest in behavioral health. Were there any personal stories or in your family or any personal experiences that also affected your interest in the issue? Um, I would say maybe just myself. The fact that I got into, to, we had situations in my family subsequently in, in uh, probably the most recent past, but those were something that having the knowledge that I had, I felt that I had failed to see some of the problems in, especially with my sister who is, has passed away. But um, they, they're, you're very good at disguising the things that are driving you to these problems. And I think that having a more open discussions uh, amongst family, that it isn't something that's taboo to say, gosh, you know, uh, Jane, you seem very depressed today, what's the problem? And, and not asking those questions. And I think we're more open to doing that now. And 10 years ago when this happened in my personal family, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have those discussions, and we do now. And I think that's, that's a good step. In terms of um, you know, my, uh, my background and, and my personal interest in psychology was the bullying that went on uh, in when I was in elementary and high school, I was bullied significantly, and I couldn't understand why people were, quote unquote, so mean to other people, and wanted to learn about behaviors that have people treat other people that way. So that would be more of my personal story. Fortunately, the only addiction I ever had was smoking, and it was <laughs> really tough <laughs> to, uh, to kick the habit, but I did it like I think alcoholics do it, one day at a time. I just thought, I'm not gonna have a cigarette today. I don't need it and you just finally build out of it. But that's, that works for some and not for others. But it was a, a personal a need to understand why people behave the way they do, uh, especially those that seem to have a lot. And uh, that was the situation in my high school. It was pretty difficult for those of us who weren't popular to be able to integrate with those who were considered popular. In fact, at my high school, there were certain areas that you were not allowed to go into if you weren't one of the chosen ones, and I was not. So I, I made the mistake as a brand new sophomore, we, it was the 10th grade, to sit in the bench that was reserved only for those on uh, the insiders. And they all surrounded me while I was trying to eat my sandwich, and I still didn't get it. You know, what is that? you know you're not supposed to be in this part of the, the quad, and I didn't, so I quickly had to pack up, and I thought, why do people do that? So that was probably more, and, and those are the things that certainly drive some people that do not have strong family to support them into these deviant behaviors, and certainly over the edge, I believe. Yeah, stigma obviously has been a huge issue over the years. Uh, last year, you co-authored legislation, as I understand it, with uh, Senator Atkins and Senator Hertzberg, and this had to do with um, making it easier to finance facilities for veterans, for active military who suffer from PTSD and associated disorders. Uh, tell me a little bit about that legislation and, and why you felt it was so important. Well, it was brought to me by the Intrepid Heroes Fund who fund these facilities throughout the nation, been incredible in terms of what they've been able to do to put on military installations, hospitals that uh, deal specifically with the mental health issues of our returning uh, you know, uh, servicemen and women and our veterans. And they, uh, the hospital at Camp Pendleton was a $12 million investment by the fund, and it was brought to me. Uh, from that uh, group and we introduced it and what it provided was a waiver of sales tax on the interior uh, improvements in the hospital itself. And uh, it took a little convincing that the state could do without a million dollars in sales tax because they pay a lot more for those who have these serious, serious uh, illnesses that are brought on by the, the terrible stress that our servicemen and women are under, and their families. So it treats families and uh, individuals. It was, uh, in, I thought, uh, probably one of the most significant uh, uh, contributions to the resources that are available to, uh, that, to our military uh, personnel. And is that going to be um, uh, distributed around the state or certain facilities? Yes, they're looking at, they were looking at other ones in California, and to be honest, I can't remember exactly where they were going next, but uh, Camp Pendleton, certainly where it is, uh, you know, the West Coast installation, and the largest, uh, where those deployed uh, to the war fronts. So it was uh, a big, 
big uh, gift, if you will, to uh, those of us who live in Southern California. Behavioral Health Action uh, is a coalition that, as you know, is representing more than 50 statewide organizations, different stakeholders, different groups, uh, and they've been really dedicated to trying to bring more attention to the behavioral health space, as you know. And, and one of the big concerns that uh, they have talked about is the fact that you have uh, separate systems of health care for diseases of the brain versus diseases of the body. Uh, how, big, how big of a problem is that and what should be done to integrate that? I think it's a huge problem because when we make, we put those in silos, it's okay, to, you know, with diabetes and heart and cancer uh, for people to rally around you, but with uh, folks who have uh, maybe even attendant mental health issues, we don't talk about that. And I don't think it's as bad as it used to be, Kevin, but certainly uh, I think we need to be looking at the whole person and I think that we're moving in that direction. Uh, we do know that there's an onset of schizophrenia and bipolar in young men when they hit somewhere between 18 and 25. There's maybe it's, they don't know if it's hormonal, uh, you know, as you grow and the different things that are happening in the body physically that bring some of these uh, things on in the brain. And so I think the very fact that that's been identified, and I actually, had a friend who had this perfect son, went to USC, uh, athlete, uh, top student, who had a uh, psychic, psych, psychic break. And uh, they were called, and nothing before, and nothing in the family. And he was able, because they had resources financially, very wealthy family, to get him intensive care, he was able to come through that, that period with you know, uh, assisted um, medication, et cetera. But to me, that's a definite, definite tie to the physical. And so looking at the whole person, when we look at someone who is admitted for mental health issues, it's probably extremely important to ensure through the various tests we can now do, how is, how is the body working? What are all of the, the functions that, uh, you know, affect you physically and mentally? How are those integrated? And I think we're on the right track. It costs money, right? It's always about funding. But if we fund it in the early stages, then maybe the cost at the later stages are dramatically reduced. Well, and you mentioned this problem with your friend's college son, and you hear all these stories about school kids today who mm -hmm. are suffering from more mental illness or depression or other kinds of behavioral health issues than ever before. So that really speaks, I think, to the importance of prevention and intervention right. and being proactive. I believe that we're bringing, uh, I believe there's some legislation, if not in the works, it's being discussed to provide more to our schools for mental health counselors uh, that are there and available. And when we see some of the horrific situations that have happened with kids uh, for whatever reason, anger, and it's exploded and taking many lives through the recent and previous gun incidences, they'd be able to identify some of that early on because it's pretty clear that uh, many of these uh, children have had issues all along while they've been in school. And identifying them, intervening in that, and providing them resources and the care they need. And a lot of it seems to be the alienation. How does that happen? And when you're alienated and you have that stress, it affects your body, no question. It affects your thinking. Uh, it affects your focus. And so those are physical uh, things that happen to you through uh, a, a mental, uh, the, it enters through the, the uh, behavior versus, you know, a physical ailment. So again, looking at the whole person from the earliest years that we can uh, and helping those individuals without, there's an issue with privacy, you know, are we going to be tracking people from the time they're born to see how they're performing physically and mentally? That's not what I'm talking about. It's the, the people that are, the resources that are there so someone can seek help and that their parents can seek uh, help uh, in, in that way. And it can be wellness. It doesn't have to be that I'm sick and therefore I need to see a psychiatrist. Uh, it's that I feel like I need some, some help in decision making. Governor Newsom has now been in office for eight months and he's been fairly outspoken about his interest in this topic. Mm -hmm. As you know, he's appointed a behavioral health czar. Uh, What's the potential for changing the conversation? And you mentioned there's already been some improvement in terms of paying, people paying more attention to this issue. But with the new governor, and I realize he's not of your party, but, but 
the fact that he has been talking more about this sort of thing, what's the potential for really addressing this issue in a substantial way? I think it's uh, there's a great opportunity, and, and uh, he's not of my party, but I think that this uh, transcends partisanship, frankly. This is, uh, this is an issue of, uh, you know, people, and uh, it's very, I'd say, nonpartisan, bipartisan, and I think we have people uh, in our legislature, both sides, who have personal stories, uh, have, uh, you know, at least, if not for themselves and their families, for friends, so I think just setting the table, it has begun, and I think it's, there's going to be a great menu. It's whether the funds are there uh, to uh, be able to implement a lot of things that we know are needed, especially with starting at younger ages in terms of uh, ensuring that people uh, have that nurturing. Uh, strong family connections, clearly in my personal life, made a difference for me. And I think that's uh, something that will be uh, the opportunity is there, and basically we're looking pretty good on the funding side. So uh, whatever the governor has in mind, I think he's going to have uh, pretty uh, significant support, uh, bipartisan support for that. Well, obviously the Behavioral Health Coalition represents a lot of the best thinking, a lot of the experts in this field, and, and they are really interested in working with legislators like yourself to try and create a more connected and more integrated and more responsive system. What do you think the coalition can do, do you believe, in working with you? What would you say? I think we, first and foremost, we need more providers, I believe. We need scholarships to get more people involved in this particular profession. And I think it's really important that we look at reimbursements. And I've made that speech on the floor in the Assembly and now <laughs> the Senate a few times. If we are not adequately reimbursing uh, people for their services through our Medi-Cal and our, and our insurance programs, then we're not going to get people interested in, in those professions. So I think that has to be one of the first things that we take a look at, because right now we do have a dearth of uh, professionals available. Uh, Tri-City Medical Hospital in my district had a terrible issue with being able, they, a lot of 5150s were being brought to uh, their receiving rooms in emergency and they were, they had one psychiatrist available uh, to look at these individuals and determine if they were, they just needed the 72 hour hold, did they need medication, did they even need that or did, was it something where they had just a, a, an immediate break and some inc incident. And so when you can't get people, you know, there to take care of uh, these situations, then uh, we don't have a start. So I think we need to encourage more um, involvement of uh, the legislature in the reimbursement issue and just talk about that first and we continue to bring it up or we're not going to have uh, the, meta the behavior health professionals. We need it at different levels, social workers, uh, counselors, psychiatrists, and on up through the medical profession. That would be number one. Uh, legislation has been introduced. I have a bill that allows portability from um, one state into California for behavioral health professionals. That's a start. But there's just lots of ideas out there that have to come together uh, to look at the, again, I go back to the whole person. What, does, what do we need in that area? And I think the, the situation is ripe for, for solutions to come forward in the short term. Senator Pat Bates, thank you so much for your time. Welcome. My and pleasure. Thank you for joining us for Behavioral Health Champions, which is a production of the Behavioral Health Action Coalition, a statewide group that's really committed to raising awareness about this issue statewide. Thanks for joining us.